They're coming to get you, Barbara. Shh. It's the Film Flamers. Hey, everybody. I'm Robert. I'm Chris. And we are the Film Flamers. It's March. Things are coming back to life from the dead of winter. And we thought, you know, the best thing to cover right now is something coming back from the dead. So we're going to cover my favorite horror movie of all time. And that is 1968's Night of the Living Dead. <laughs> But before we get into Night of the Living Dead, we have some housekeeping items that we'd like to get out of the way. Uh, First and foremost, we have some Patreon episodes on the way, and that is Entrails of a Scene, in which we are covering the films The Thing and Dawn of the Dead, in connection with this episode, Night of the Living Dead. That's right. We also have some sequel ideas coming out for Night of the Living Dead. So head over to patreon.com slash thefilmflamers. You can find both of those episodes and all of our previous content for which there are hours and hours. You can get that for as low as $2. And on our regular feed this month, of course, besides this episode, Not a Living Dead, we're also going to be giving you our top 10 zombie movies, our hot take of the movie Velvet Buzzsaw, as well as a brand new segment we're bringing to our main feed, which is Shooting the Flames, where we talk about a lot of the news and uh, we answer a lot of your comments and questions that you've left us on social media. That's right. So keep those coming. With that out of the way, let's begin our discussion of Night of the Living Dead. That's right. Let's rise up and do it. Night of the Living Dead is a 1968 American independent horror film written, directed, photographed, and edited by George (laughs) A. Romero. Uh, It's also co-written by John Russo and stars Dwayne Jones and Judith Adia. It was released on October the 1st, 1968 uh, to, uh, let's just say, mixed acclaim. You know, I think we'll get into some of that later on, but uh, let's just say it caused a little bit of controversy. The story follows seven people who are trapped in a rural farmhouse in western Pennsylvania, which is besieged by a large and growing group of living dead monsters, or ghouls, as they are called in this film, or referred to. Uh, Night of the Living Dead is truly independent, made on a budget of $114,000, which I mean, today's money, I think, is obviously more than that, but for the day, that was a very low amount. However, its box office total for that year and the subsequent year internationally grossed 30 million dollars so uh return on investment completely happened yeah it earned over 250 times its budget making it one of the most successful independent films of all time unfortunately Romero didn't see much of this due to his lack of knowledge of uh film distribution deals at the time That's right. This movie is pretty highly regarded today as a classic. Uh, Rotten Tomatoes listed at 97%, so it's certified fresh. Uh, There's an audience score of 87% on there as well. As you mentioned, when it first came out, it was uh, criticized a lot for its explicit gore, but obviously it has become the cult classic, and it has gotten a lot of analyzation over the years, and it is looked at with a lot of love in the community, film-wise, not just horror and uh, it has actually been preserved and selected in the Library of Congress in the National Film Registry as a film deemed culturally, historically, or aesthetically significant. Night of the Living Dead led to five subsequent films between 1978 and 2010, also directed by Romero, and inspired two remakes. The most well-known remake was released in 1990, directed by none other than special effects guru Tom Savini. That's right, and we'll talk about that remake a little bit later in the episode as well. So without further ado... Here is George A. Romero's Night of the Living Dead. Welcome to a night of total terror. (laughs) Night of the Living Dead. The dead who live on living flesh. The dead whose haunted souls hunt the living. The living whose bodies are the only food for these ungodly creatures. Night of the living dead. A bizarre adventure in fear. An experience in shock, more shattering than your strangest nightmare. Night of the living dead. Oh! 
A night with the dead who cannot die. A night of total terror. Night. Of the living dead. At the behest of their mother, Johnny, played by Russell Steiner, and Barbara, played by Judith Odea, have driven several hours out into the country to place flowers on their father's grave. Growing irritable from the car ride, Johnny has become quite uphill. He has a recovered memory of scaring his sister in that cemetery and, in a real dick move, decides to scare her again by saying, They're coming to get you, Barbara. As a strange man shambles towards them. There goes one of them now. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously frightened, Barbara passes near the strange man who suddenly attacks her. Johnny attempts to save her but gets his head smashed into a gravestone in the process. Barbara escapes to their car and has to coast down a hill when she discovers there are no keys. After crashing into a tree that slowly came out of nowhere, <laughs> slowly came out of nowhere. She just like sort of coasts toward that tree and hits it. You know why she they even, did like, that? Steer out. Yeah, because there's a dent in the car. Yeah. Right. <laughs> anyway, after slowly crashing into a tree that came out of nowhere, Barbara escapes on foot to a farmhouse with the strange man close behind her. Barbara panics when she finds a woman's mangled corpse upstairs and flees the house, only to be confronted by more strange men like the one in the cemetery. But there is another man outside, Ben, played by Dwayne Jones, who pushes her safely back into the house. After a couple of the strangers make their way into the house and attack Barbara, Ben fights them off and decides it's best to board up the doors and windows. While searching for wood, he finds a radio and a shotgun. Not much of a helper, Barbara instead descends into shock and insanity before being encouraged to pass out on the couch. Ben finishes his work just as the cellar door opens and reveals more people hiding downstairs. Harry and Helen Cooper and their injured daughter, Karen. Also hiding are Tom and Judy, a young couple from a neighboring town. Ben and Harry start out on the wrong foot when Ben asks why they didn't come up to help him secure the house. Harry claims that they couldn't be sure what was going on upstairs. Harry demands they all return to hide in the cellar, but Ben will not have any of that, as there's nowhere to escape from once they're downstairs. Harry returns to the cellar and his family, while Tom and Judy remain upstairs. Barbara awakens from her stupor, but remains fairly quiet and shocked. The radio broadcast explains that there's a rash of mass murder sweeping across the east coast of the U.S. Meanwhile, an ever-growing army of ghouls mills around outside, being generally creepy and eating bugs. Which is gross. No bugs to eat. <laughs> Downstairs, Harry and Helen fight for what is obviously not the first time. She becomes pissed when he's let slip that there is a radio upstairs. She demands to join the group, and Harry reluctantly concedes. Upstairs, Ben has discovered a TV and has set it up in the living room. From a news report, the group learns that recently deceased corpses have been returning to life and eating the living. Experts are unsure of the cause, although some feel that a contaminated space probe that returned to Earth is the culprit. When a list of refuge centers is shown on TV, Ben decides to get Helen and Harry's daughter Karen, who obviously was bitten by a ghoul, some medical attention. They need to fill his truck up with gas at a locked pump outside. A plan is concocted that involves Ben and Tom going for gas while Harry tosses Molotov cocktails out the window to ease their trip. As Tom and Ben leave, Judy follows at the last minute and climbs into the truck. They arrive at the pump and attempt to shoot the lock off of it, causing a fire that quickly spreads to the truck. Tom attempts to drive the truck away to safety, but it explodes, killing Judy and himself. The ghouls eat their charred remains. Ben runs back to the house, where Harry has left the door locked. He breaks inside and beats the shit out of Harry for being such a coward. <laughs> a report on the news shows posses of armed men patrolling the countryside killing ghouls and explains that all it takes to kill these things is a shot or a blow to the head. Suddenly, the electricity goes out and Harry grabs Ben's gun as the ghouls break into the house. The two fight and Ben gets the rifle back and shoots Harry, who stumbles into the cellar, dying next to the corpse of his daughter, Karen. The ghouls attempt to break down the door and try to pull Helen and Barbara through it but Helen escapes to the cellar where she finds a reanimated Karen devouring her father. Helen is frozen in shock and fear while her daughter stabs her to death with a trowel. 
Back upstairs, Barbara loses control when she sees her brother Johnny, now a ghoul, attempting to break through the door amongst the other undead, and is being pulled out the door and eaten. Here's Johnny! (laughs) As the ghouls overrun the house, Ben retreats to the basement and locks himself in. He shoots the reanimated corpses of the Coopers as the ghouls ransack the house above. In the morning, Ben awakens to the sound of the posse's gunfire outside. Believing that he's about to be rescued, he heads upstairs only to be shot in the head by some asshole who thinks he's a ghoul. His body is then tossed onto a pile of corpses and promptly set on fire. The Tragic End As we mentioned earlier, this movie is well-received now and is considered a classic, but back when it was first released, that wasn't quite the case. It did cause some controversy about all of its gore, and essentially it was released about a month before the MPAA released its rating system. So Mm -hmm. um, children were allowed to go see this movie on a Saturday matinee if they so decided to, right? Sure. And I mean... It's safe to say that this movie, if it were made today, would at least receive like a PG-13, if not a hard R rating. Right? Sure. So, um, but in subsequent years, uh, it has grown to quite some acclaim. So things like the New York Times placed th- this movie on their best 1,000 movies ever list. Um, in January 2010, Total Film included it in its 100 greatest movies of all time. Rolling Stone has named Night of the Living Dead as the one... As one of the 100 Maverick movies of the last 100 years, and Reader's Digest found it to be the 12th scariest movie of all time. Sure. And you can't really overstate the influence this film has had and the legacy that it has. It basically single-handedly redefined the modern and colloquial use of the word zombie. Because before that, it was basically just like Haitian zombies. Right. You know, this was, uh, you know, before that, it was basically... You know, zombies by proxy of control of like Bela Lugosi somewhere in, in Haiti, right? So like white from white zombie. And, uh, and that was basically the idea of that. And so he basically popularized the idea of he didn't really even think of them as zombies. He essentially just thought of them, you know, what happens when people just stop dying, when they, you know, when they come back to life and how do people react to that? And what are the settings and what can we say about that? And that's the story is how people react to that in that situation, either in a good way or in a very poor way. Well, that's true. And I think that with this movie, Romero sort of like revolutionized horror, at least as we knew it at that particular time, right? We were used to seeing things set very, very far away from like suburban America, you know, where we had like hammer films that were set in like Transylvania and so on and so forth. But he really brought horror to you know, suburban, rural America and places that you think that you're safe, but you're really not in a in a Romero film. Now, there had been a little bit of that, and I'm, I'm actually wondering if he was influenced by some other things, maybe not in film, but on television. And while this film did obviously influence the entire horror genre and basically ushered in the splatter subgenre and maybe even influenced the found footage and heightened realism uh, in some of these films that yeah. came out after it. But like, um, I, I go to them think about like the, um, of course, the anthology series Twilight Zone. In season one, episode twenty two in 1960, there was an episode called "The Monsters Are Due on Maple Street." Yes, right, and it was written by Rod Sterling, um, of course, the creator and narrator of the series, and it uh, originally aired in 1960, obviously on CBS. And, of course, Time named it one of the top 10 best Twilight Zone episodes ever. And so I'm wondering, since this is eight years before, if he had actually kind of seen that and that was kind of taking place in this suburbia with, like, neighbors kind of turning on each other in this emergency. And, and, you know, it did end up being aliens, but it was a social experiment by aliens to see – You know, if they could create some sort of paranoia and basically all they had to do was turn off the power, you know, and and make people feel isolated and panicked, you know, what are people going to do? And they ended up just turning on each other. And so we see a lot of that in Night of the Living Dead. And that had a heightened realism and, of course, also black and white because all television was black and white at this point, basically, uh, including newsreels. I think that he had to have been influenced by that at least a little bit, at least that Twilight Zone episode. Um, I know that. 
when I was studying literature, both in high school and in college, I had to read the teleplay for that particular Twilight Zone sure. episode. Yeah, it's, mm-hmm. it's very famous. And I mean, it really does show you what normal Americans would do in that given situation. And I think that the time that Romero has made this movie in the late 60s, we have gone through so much in the 50s and the early 60s oh, that sure. would influence this. Things like the Vietnam War, the Cold War, you know, any sort of like bomb scare and crisis, right? And I think people in America were just quite afraid of the other, right? Or whoever that other would possibly be. Yeah. And um, I think that, you know, this movie came out in just such a time as to make it incredibly scary for a number of people to watch, not just for, you know, zombies themselves, but for whatever they got from the film. Romero did say that he did directly draw inspiration from Richard Matheson's I Am Legend, uh, the novel that came out in 1954, uh, obviously about a plague that ravages a futuristic Los Angeles. Um, and he's quoted to say, so what if the dead stop staying dead? And the stories are about how people respond or fail to respond to this as far as the social commentary. He basically gave a lot of props to the character for basically saying, hey, I'm the last human. Like, what am I doing? Like, why can't I join? You know, the despair that kind of is that that like we were talking about off um, off recording. We were talking about this kind of heightened depression or despair. Right. Um, right. This gr- on a grand scale. And so he obviously drew uh, inspiration for that. And there's been several remakes of that or, or, you know, and especially I think in the 70s, there was a couple. Uh, yeah, the Omega made. Man was yeah, one. Sure. Right. So this uh, that was an inspiration. And he's actually been asked if like the Vietnam War or the assassination of. Uh, Martin Luther King was an inspiration behind some of the like the social commentary and stuff, especially with the the way the newsreels were filmed. And a lot of these newsreels were filmed or shown, I think, at the movie theater. So it's very possible that some people could have seen some of these newsreels right before seeing Night of the Living Dead as they sat down in their theater seats. And those were, of course, the grainy black and white newsreels, uh, search and destroy operations, helicopters, graphic carnage. Um in fact, in the 2009 documentary film Nightmares in Red, White, and Blue, the zombies in the film are compared to a silent majority of the U.S. in the late 1960s that basically did nothing about Vietnam or had nothing to say about the racial tensions right. and basically compared to as zombies. So Romero confessed that the film was designed to reflect the tensions at the time, and he said – It was 1968, man. Everyone had a message. The anger and attitude and all that's there is just because it was the 60s. We lived at the farmhouse. So we were always into raps about the implication and the meaning. And so some of that just naturally crept in. And I think he did a superb job at that. And he has a really good job, I think, with especially some of his other films like Dawn of the Dead, of making that uh, social commentary almost seem incidental. And, of course, he's a very humble man. And so we don't – we may never know how much of that was – really intentioned or not, but obviously he had to make a decisions and he basically, you know, wrote and directed the thing. So in cast, so I think we can give him a hundred percent of the credit here. I mean, I have to agree completely. I'm a huge fan of George A. Romero. I think that his movies are great and he has a lot of things to say. And I really appreciate, you know, his, his humbleness as a filmmaker when he's asked about like, while he cast, uh, Dwayne Jones, he will never come out and say it was for, you know, some sort of race reason. He was just the best actor for the particular role. And it's things like that that he's done, well, had done throughout his entire career. He'll take credit for helming a movie, but he won't take credit for, you know, the, the social commentary that's being made in just about every movie that he helms. Mm-hmm. Um, I've said before on this podcast, and I'm going to say again right now, that Night of the Living Dead is my favorite horror movie of all time. And um, I think that when you're watching movies, sometimes there's like this like, uh, you know, coalescence of, you know, situations that sort of make it the right time for you to see a movie. Right. And I first saw Night of the Living Dead the summer between my eighth and ninth grade years. And I was really struggling with, you know, coming to terms with being a homosexual and, you know, what it felt to be you know, an other in a society. And this movie was showing randomly on PBS one night and I was up late and I just happened to watch it and I was completely blown away. And it just like, I I had never thought about horror movies before in this sense. And by then I was a pretty seasoned horror watcher. I had seen so many movies, but this was the first time that I really realized that horror can say something to both you 
and to an audience at large and that it's not just monsters and a good time. Like these people really have something to say. And I think that George Romero is at the forefront of, you know, horror directors with a message. And the film also seems just more poignant, even though some people just may not get into black and white films that made it a lot more poignant. And I know that I mentioned this um, just a few minutes ago, but I mean, I, I feel like that's one of the most important decisions they made because they got some new funding about a week into filming and they had a choice at that point to go down to like 16 millimeter film that was in color or stick with 35 millimeter that was in black and white. And there was a lot of debate, but Romero actually argued that he wanted to stick to black and white, noting that some of the more brutal scenes that he'd witnessed ever in film were in black and white, like on the waterfront with um, yeah. Marlon Brando uh, getting the crap kick out of him. And, you know, that blood that's just black, you know, uh, you can think about Psycho with that chocolate syrup, you know, and they, of course, use chocolate syrup in this film. For the Bosco blood. all through this movie, But right? also the news, which was huge at the time for everything. And all of that um, was in black and white at that time because basically all of TV it was black and white. Um, and, of course, those reels from Vietnam. So it it really kind of turned the tables and made America look at itself a little bit more. And I just think that was such a strong decision to make this film. Well, and I agree, too. And I know that this movie is sort of a primer as to what's going to happen to America just a couple years after its release, when the Vietnam War is going to become a household topic, you know, on nightly news on the television. Because right after this, that TV just like super exploded into the 70s. And, you know, the horrors that we hear about or we're used to seeing on newsreels and the movies is now you know a nightly fixture in your home. And so, like, the kind of violence that people were shocked about when watching Night of the Living Dead is slowly just becoming part of their lives. And, I mean, people talk about the suburban sprawl of America in the late 60s and 70s. And that's really what this movie was a precursor to. Um, not only is it bringing horror to America or parts of America that we don't normally see, I mean – it's not very shortly after that that we don't even talk about like rural America anymore. Starting in the seventies, it's really just big cities and suburbs. Yep, exactly. And other than those obvious kind of things that you can kind of see on the surface, like the racial tensions, the Vietnam illusions, the disillusionment, the apathy, all that stuff. But there was also um, wrapped up in this, at least with maybe some overanalyzations um, that's subjective at this point, uh, given that so much time has passed. But you can see a little bit in the layers of this film, like a disillusionment with government and the patriarchal nuclear family. Oh, definitely. Um, and the flaws inherent in the media, local and federal government agencies, and the entire mechanism of civil defense. Well, and you talked about Silent Majority, too, earlier in this episode. And, I mean, that was a big standing point for Richard Nixon at the time. I think he talked about it in one of his addresses. Like, he was asking for the Silent Majority's backing, right? Like he really wanted those people who didn't want to talk about the hot button issues to stay with him and to support him. And I mean, obviously I wasn't alive in the sixties, so I have no idea. And, you know, at this point, looking back in American history, all we really talk about is like counterculture and hippies and things like that. That's what really has stood out. But I have to imagine like how many people were part of this silent majority that were witnessing these things and just did not talk about it in their home. It's something that's completely foreign to me as an American today. I think that our politics is discussed regularly, you know, amongst family and friends. It's not completely unheard of. But at this time, you know, they were always talking about like, oh, this particular trouble and that particular trouble could be like race riots, you know, mm -hmm. or anti-war protests, you know, and it's just a completely different time period, and it's so hard to wrap my head around what he was trying to convey in this particular movie. Before we get into some of these heavier topics, too, let's talk about the release of this film a little bit. I think that uh, it had to have been completely shocking for people to to witness something like this for the first time in movies. I think that... Yeah, I was actually surprised seeing it for the first time with all of the, like, the basically the entrails that people are eating on screen. Right. Because you don't even see that much today. Um, you know, there's, you know, splattered throughout history since this film. <laughs> uh, but no, it. I was actually shocked. This is 1968. And that's the kind of, I, I almost want to say that's the first time that you, you see a viscera kind of on screen being, I could be wrong, uh, you know, in this fashion, kind of ultra realistic heightened, you know, right. way kind of just like very matter of factly being eaten by these 
things, these ghouls. Well, as far as cannibalism goes, yeah, I would say this is pretty one of the first movies. I mean, there are some movies that came out before Night of the Living Dead that sort of, you know, had some violence in it. Things like, I mean, like Peeping Tom, I think, came out before that. A lot of British movies had Mm -hmm. some, like, ultra-realistic violence for the time. But this one was really delivered to America in such a way that it was easily accessible for them to watch. And no one really knew what they were going to be expecting when they saw this movie. Yeah. And it's very matter of fact, I keep saying matter of fact, but it's very kind of found footagey kind of in a way because there's no really preparation for seeing these things happening on the screen. And, and it also kind of grossed out the people that were actually playing the zombies on set. Uh, they were basically eating, um, you know, like out of the burnt truck, uh, they were eating, roast ham covered in chocolate sauce and so like the filmmakers actually joked that it was so nauseous like inducing that uh it was almost a waste of time putting the makeup on the zombies that they end up looking pale and sick anyway <laughs> that's so fucking nasty too you know what after we were finished recording this let's go see if we can get some ham and put some chocolate sauce on it because i'm kind of like curious to see what it tastes like no thanks no mm-hmm. uh one of my favorite quotes uh, from a critic about this movie comes from roger ebert and he saw this movie at a matinee um, and there were kids everywhere because at the time kids went to go see horror movies is what they were marketed to. And this is kind of a long quote, so just bear with me. But he says, the kids in the audience were stunned. They were almost in complete silence. The movie had stopped being delightfully scary about halfway through and become unexpectedly terrifying. There was a little girl across the aisle from me, maybe nine years old, who was sitting very still in her seat and crying. It's hard to remember what sort of effect this movie might have had on you when you were six or seven, but try to remember. At that age, kids take events on screen seriously, and they identify fiercely with the hero. When the hero is killed, that's not an unhappy ending, but a tragic one. Nobody got out alive. It's all over. That's all. And that's exactly what this movie is. It is the very definition of nihilism. Yeah. And his subsequent films are just like that too. He really has taken this apocalyptic viewpoint of America and shown us all the shit that we are, you know, going to experience. There's no happy endings in any Romero film. But we love seeing people battle with inevitability. And that's a recurring theme, you know, across genres. And I think that's something that we all enjoy watching um, because it's just, it goes to, especially in America, it goes to like the spirit, right? Yeah. So I think that's just part of it. And uh, people seeing people rise up against a depression or something like that. Yeah. Right. But I mean, I, even when he tries to do something like that in his, in his dead movies, especially I, I, he really just starts to center on that nihilism. So, so much that there's just no, no happy ending is going to happen. Mm-hmm. Uh, this movie, like we said before, has had many, many deep themes that people have talked about, you know, over the last several decades since its release. Uh, one of those is uh, race. I think it's, it's too hard to talk about Night of the Living Dead and not talk about some racial tensions that were happening in the 60s and the way this movie was cast and written. Well, yeah, the lead role was actually originally written for someone of Caucasian descent. But of course, they ended up casting African-American actor Dwayne Jones. And Romero intentionally did not alter the script to reflect that. And asked in 2013 if he took inspiration from the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. that same year, Romero responded in the negative, noting that he'd only heard about the shooting when he was actually on his way to find distribution for the finished film. Yeah, I think the story goes for that is that they finished editing the movie. They threw it in the can, threw it in the car and started driving to New York to find someone to distribute it. Mm -hmm. And it was on the way to New York that they heard on the radio that Martin Luther King had been assassinated. But the the script actually also, even though it was for Caucasian, um, the script had been written for Ben as a rather simple truck driver. Um, His dialogue was that of like a lower class or uneducated person. And Dwayne Jones was a very well-educated man, and he simply refused to do the role as written. Uh And Dwayne himself upgraded his own dialogue to reflect how he felt the character should present himself. And that's, I mean, and he did. Uh, Romero also said that they didn't, you know, change a whole lot until, you know, Dwayne said, here's what needs to happen. And I think that that was the best way to, to film this movie too, because, uh, we're presented with a character that is so out of place for that particular time period. And I think that it's not represented, especially since he ends up like hitting a woman. And so it was interesting to see how that was played, but that was not the takeaway from the film. The racial elements were incidental and not an, uh, a really a theme as far as like what was happening on screen, you know, like between the characters, I would say, the character in a play. 
And I think too, and this is this is sometimes like you, obviously we read a lot into movies that we watch, and it, it may not have been intentional for you know the actor standpoint or the director standpoint. But when I watch Night of the Living Dead, I can sort of see the racial tensions between Harry and Ben there, and it could just be tensions between two men. You know what I mean? But I think that my brain sort of like throws the racial stuff in there. There's a scene where they're talking about taking Karen to get medical attention. And Harry says, well, she can't walk. You know, there's no way that we can get her there. And Ben says, well, I'll carry her. Right. And the look on Harry's face when he says that is of complete shock, both like, no, I'm not letting you carry my daughter. And I think, too, he's like, well, how come I didn't offer to carry my own child. That's what I got from yeah. that because it was of course written um, and it intentionally not changed. And so the actors could have done a lot. There was a lot of improv in this film. Yeah. You know, basically this is what we want to come, come across. You can go ahead and do it. And in fact, all of uh, Barbara's like monologue of basically what had happened with her brother as he's Ben's trying to board up the door was essentially just improv. And that that kind of shocked me when I learned that because it was so specific of performance and, and specific of thing of, of, of how to do it. And uh, she did it so well. And I'm just shocked that this cast didn't, didn't really go on to do more things. You're right. And I like the first time I watched this movie and the first several times that I watched this movie, I thought to myself, my gosh, what a terrible character Barbara is. I was like, she's useless, you know, um, but over the years, I have grown to love her because <clears throat> that's the way that so many of us would react in a situation like that. You know, we're going to be in shock when things first happen. And it takes days or weeks to really, you know, understand the situation that you're going to be in. But your first reaction is going to be of disbelief and shock, right? And once I found out that she had improvised a lot of those lines, I was like, bravo. I mean, like, mm -hmm. it's a really good performance. It's kind of hard to play shocked or scared or, you know, almost insane at that point, believably, but I think that she does. I think that Dwayne Jones plays a very capable hero very, very well. And it's, you know, it's, it's kind of refreshing to see someone from the get-go know how to take charge and lead a situation so effectively. Yes. You mentioned earlier about uh, the patriarchal nuclear family, and that was such a big part of, you know, America from, you know, post-World War II up into the 60s or late Certainly 60s. Certainly in the especially. 50s, yeah. Yeah. And so it was, you know, very important for people to, you know, subscribe to the idea of the American dream, right? And everyone had a place in the family. The man was supposed to go out and make money. Women were supposed to go home and take care of the family, her husband, and children are supposed to be dutiful, right? And I think that in this particular movie, we see a complete breakdown of those particular notions. Uh, we see Harry, who is still holding, clinging on to those beliefs of the American dream and wanting to control and protect his family and control at the cost the of everything else. And exactly, his wife wants right. to break free. And of course, it ends up getting subverted with the daughter essentially eating him. That is exactly right. The very first interaction we see with this married couple is he comes down and he starts talking about like, you know, they won't listen to me and, you know, they're losing control. And she asks him, that's important to you, isn't it? Right. Uh -huh. You know, and so it's just like you could just see everything about America changing at that particular time in this movie, not just racially, but also like in the family and women's lib, like women are standing up for themselves and they're saying, I want to have a voice in what's going on. Right. Not just, you know, at America at large, but in this particular movie, trying to be safe from zombies. Right. Sure. It's as simple as that. And this couple bickers and fights constantly throughout this movie well it's almost the definition of like toxic masculinity when you will risk your family and your own life just to appear to be in control that's true you know and not only that too but i think that the, the most important part of that particular couple being their child who is injured they seem to ignore for a large part of that movie it's all about which one of them has power in their relationship which one can get the best jab at each other even at the expense of not helping their daughter who's laying dying on a slab in a basement mm -hmm. right and i mean so like we have all these like you know hippies and like university power struggles or like um, protests about the war going on we have in this movie the embodiment of what's going to happen later on in life for America. And that's a child rising against their parents and ultimately destroying them for her own particular gain. Mm, that's dark. Well, that's life. <laughs> <laughs> 
Night of Living Dead teaches us, and particularly filmmakers, the importance of following all the rules. Because Night of the Living Dead entered the public domain because of one small exclusion? Issue. Issue? Because of one small issue. They didn't put a copyright notice on their title card. Yep. So Night of the Living Dead started out being called something completely different. It was called what first, Chris? It was called Night of Anubis. But of course, for those of you who don't know, that's like the Egyptian or Kemetan, um, god of embalming and mummifying. Um, and uh, essentially the title was changed once Romero learned that, of course, very few people understood that reference. Yeah. Uh, subsequently, it was called Night of the Flesh Eaters, and I think that's how the that's how they filmed it. That's how they made their you know credit sequences and title cards. And they went and they found a distributor, and they wanted to change the name yet again to Night of the Living Dead, which I mean, if you look at it, is a much much better title. But when they changed the name and they made the new title cards, they failed to put their copyright notice on there. Mm-hmm. That's right. So the franchise is actually called Of the Dead, right? And so I'm wondering why, like, Dawn of the Dead and Day of the Dead weren't called, you know, Dawn of the Living Dead and Day of the Living Dead. Maybe he was so pissed off about that one particular thing that he cut that Of the Living completely out of there. I don't know. Living is a misnomer. Yeah. (laughs) Well, because they're not. I mean, they're just walking dead, I guess, which is something else completely. (laughs) But yeah, yeah, so I I know that George Romero did not make a lot of money off this movie, partially because he didn't understand how, you know, distribution process worked, which we said before. But I would imagine that if things were copyrighted, uh, you know, a little bit more appropriately, it would be completely different today. If you go onto Amazon, you can find hundreds of different DVD, Blu-ray releases. I think there's there's like 20 different streaming options, right? Essentially, anybody could grab onto this movie and release it in whatever way they saw fit. Wow. So don't do it. Yeah, that's stealing, everybody. Don't steal from Jorge. Poor Jorge. <laughs> Pobrecito Jorge. Uh, one thing that I find interesting is that we've mentioned a particular person that has kind of circles around Romero a lot. Um, we mentioned him in our Brightest Flame Award uh, for Best Makeup artist or special effects makeup artist and that is tom savini and he actually starred uh did the makeup and starred in or at least had an appearance in dawn of the dead um years later but he was actually originally hired for night of the living dead um and uh the two were first introduced to each other when savini auditioned for an acting role in an earlier film that never got off the ground uh but romero remembering that savini also was a makeup artist because he had brought his makeup portfolio to show to romero at the audition um he called savini to the set of the horror movie uh however savini wasn't able to do the effects because he was called to duty by the u.s army to serve as a combat photographer in vietnam i know that's so interesting actually Mm -hmm. but of course he like i said he later appeared in dawn of the dead and directed uh night of the living dead remake in 1990 have you seen the remake yet no yeah i have a soft spot in my heart for this one normally if i love a movie as much as this i tend to not care for the remake that changes from time to time as you may have heard about in our poltergeist episode with cocktail party massacre i i tolerate that one in this particular case i actively love it it's so different from the original and barbara is such a different character and i think we finally get like the the final girl that i kind of wanted out of barbara to begin with in that one Uh so it's certainly worth a watch if you guys haven't seen it um, well, there's certainly been a rash of strong female characters in film, as well as sympathetic female villains in films between uh, 68 and 90, right? Yeah. And so, uh, of course, I, I think that would change. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And we'd be remiss if we didn't talk about some of the sequels that came after Night of the Living Dead. I know that as far as horror canon goes, people love Dawn of the Dead. Day of the Dead is also good for its own merits, but there was a whole rash of movies, um, you know, in the early 2000s and beyond before Romero died. Oh, yeah. Uh, I mean, we've got Dawn of the Dead in 1978, Day of the Dead in 1985, uh, Land of the Dead in 2005, Diary of the Dead in 2007, and Survival of the Dead in 2009. That's right. And I've seen them all. Some are better than others, you know, but as an overarching, you know, storyline it's it's pretty good and i am a huge fan of romero like i said before and it was fun to watch anything that he has made yeah however i will say that land of the dead is by far like one of the worst 
movies. How were the um, ones after that? They were okay. They were more independent. Land of the Dead was a big budget, almost studio horror movie, and that really doesn't fit Romero's style. Yeah. You know? Um, he made other movies in between, things like Creep Show and Monkey Shines, you know, and there, some of these titles may come up in some of our future episodes. So, but I think it's safe to say that this was, you know, the start of, you know, his opus, which was his De- the Dead series. Yeah. And honestly, uh, we mentioned how this is a legacy and was influential, but it basically gave a lot of, pe- I feel like John Carpenter <laughs> and like Wes Craven and people like that um, have a lot to owe to George Romero as far as the style and kind of guerrilla filmmaking uh, that he used and basically gave these people, oh, I could do this, you know, Definitely. and make it really good and, may, and have it taken seriously. So that's how we, uh, I think uh, that's no small part of how we got things like Halloween, you know, or Nightmare on Elm Street even, or some of these others. I think that Craven and um, Hooper actually owe Romero a huge, uh, you know, debt because sure. they, he made this movie on such a small budget and there was so much shocking violence in it that when Craven got around to making Last House on the Left and Hooper got around to making Texas Chainsaw Massacre, which also shocked audiences at the time, it couldn't have happened if he hadn't made this movie. Yep. Not to mention things like The Walking Dead, you know, one of the most successful television shows of all time. Well, any given yeah. zombie movie. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Since 1968. I mean, he made the rules. He crafted the modern zombie movie. Yeah. So, uh, before we finish up, we always have a couple questions that we need to answer. And the first one is, is Night of Living Dead a horror film? He's looking at me like, no, it's not a horror film. And I'm thinking, Chris, you're wrong. It's a horror movie. Obviously, it's a horror film. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> Obviously, this is a horror movie. There's zombies eating entrails. There's people getting blown up in trucks and people getting trapped in houses. And I think that the scariest part of this movie, however, has nothing to do with the living dead, but the actual living. Yeah, This was designed to be a horror movie through and through. It was not horror adjacent. It is not incidentally horror. It is horror. Right. So were you scared with this movie? Um, no, but I didn't see it until my, <laughs> well, I don't know if I want to admit this. Well, on I'll put podcast. my camera away. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I, uh, I didn't see this until like a year ago. <laughs> I'd seen Dawn of the Dead over and over and over. And I was like, this, there's no way it can be as good. Like, and I'd seen clips and I knew what happened and I knew all about it. And I basically felt like I'd seen it Uh, and I saw it and I really, really enjoyed it, you know? And so I rectified that. Um, There is no shame in any of that because I mean, I, like I said, I saw this movie when I was about 14 years old. And at the time I had seen Dawn of the Dead and Day of the Dead, Return of the Living Dead countless amounts of times. I thought I knew what zombie movies were and I never actively sought this out. In fact, if there were anything else remotely, you know, I thought more entertaining on TV that particular night, I wouldn't have seen it then, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think this movie sometimes gets overlooked by, you know, people who appreciate horror, but don't really seek it out. And I think that if they actually took the time to watch it, they would find that it's a pretty scary movie. I mean, at least for its themes, if not for what's going on on screen. Yeah. And finally, and some would say most importantly, who's the hottest guy in Night of the Living Dead? Ben. Zombie number four. No, one. Ben. Ben, you think so? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, he's he's good looking. Well, I'm kind of attracted to intelligence and, you know, agency and uh, <laughs> all of that. <laughs> hey, well, he, has, he had kind of, to me, he really had a kind of a Gregory Peck vibe. Oh, definitely. To him. And uh, that's, to me, that's very attractive. So um, I would say hands down. Oh, my God. I'm going to sound so completely shallow. But I think that uh, Tom... That's the hottest guy in The Living Dead. Tom Savini? Not Tom Savini. He was he taking like pictures troll. of Vietnam. <laughs> uh, the uh, the young lover, Tom, the boyfriend of Judy. He's kind of like... Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah he's yeah. kind of buff, and he's got that like chiseled face, right? And he's wearing a shirt that's obviously like 12 times too small for him. And I'm just like, ooh, who's yeah, this? I, I don't want to do our stupid aesthetic judgy thing, because like on, on him at least, because he ended up killing himself later, so... He was trying to save people. The thing is, I mean, so, I mean, like you were no, talking about. Like in real life. The actor oh killed my God, himself. He did. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's okay. He's still hot. 
um, he has this one particular monologue where he's talking to his girlfriend, Judy, and like times are times are hard. Times are tough. Right. And he's like, where's that smile? You always have that smile for me. You know, and at the time I was just like, that's so nice. How come no one says that shit to me ever? And I'm like, what a good boyfriend. Well, the way you just said it sounded creepy. <laughs> Just, just the way it comes out of my mouth. I'm sorry. That's why I'm perpetually lonely. <laughs> Where's that smile? <laughs> you always have a smile for me right before I cut it off. <laughs> well, I think that we have just uh, beat this zombie to death. What do you think, Chris? Anything else you have to say about it? At least it? undeath. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, let us know what you think about our conversation on Night of the Living Dead. Like I said, it is my favorite horror movie of all time. And if you happen to agree with that, let me know. I would love to have some further conversations with you guys. And I'm sure Chris would as well. Yeah. You can do that on social media. You can find us on Twitter or Facebook at The Film Flamers. And you can email us at tiredqueens at filmflamers.com. That's right. You can find all of our previous episodes wherever you get your podcast or visit our website at www.filmflamers.com. Please, if you enjoyed this episode or any other episode, go to iTunes or Apple Podcasts and give us that five-star rating and leave us a little snippet of a review. It might be read on future episodes coming up. That is correct. Also, we mentioned our Patreon content at the beginning of this episode. So if you'd like to check those out, go to patreon.com slash thefilmflamers. We have a lot more coming out for you in March. Look forward to our top 10 favorite zombie movies, like we said before. We have a new segment called Shooting the Flames coming out, sort of a conversational, relaxed episode with me and Chris. And we have a hot take of Velvet Buzzsaw. So if you haven't seen that yet, head over to Netflix and watch it before the conversation drops. Next month, we are going straight into comedy horror. It's April Fool's, and we're not wasting any time. We're talking about 1980s slashic comedy. Slashic? Slashic, that's right. You know, a classic slasher. <laughs> okay. I didn't coin that. 1980s slashic comedy horror. Student bodies. That's right. This is one of Chris's favorites, guys, so you definitely want to listen to that conversation. Yep. Well, until our next episode, guys. Sweet dreams. <laughs> <laughs>